so hello everyone welcome to my new video so today in this video i will discuss with you all about a very important topic that you all should know as an optometrist so i'm talking about subjective refraction techniques so this subjective refraction technique is very important in your day-to-day -day, uh, opd practice where you are giving glasses to the patient okay so having a proper idea about those techniques is very much useful in your clinical life so for that reason i will discuss in this matter with you all okay so let's start so what is mean by a refraction so the, uh, it is simply finding out the refractive status of the eye is known as refraction okay so here refraction is two types we do refraction in two ways one is objective refraction another is subjective refraction right so uh, objective refraction here we find out the uh, refractive status of the eye by using some instrument without having any input from the patient or without uh, having any involvement of the patient that is objective refraction and uh, uh, subjective refraction here we find out the refractive status of the eye uh, with the help of patient response that is subjective refraction right so here normally this subjective refraction is done after objective refraction uh, but without objective refraction subjective refraction can be done so to save the time and energy generally the objective refraction is done before subjective refraction but in case of corneal scar or any lenticular changes at this case objective refraction can't be performed so there you need to depend on completely on the subjective refraction so having a very good idea uh, about those procedures of subjective refraction will help you a lot in your day-to-day -day OPD practice okay now let's move to the next slide here these are the components of subjective refraction where uh, you can see that uh, this is the uh, what to say this is the trial set uh, okay this is the trial frame this is a trial set in trial set you will get this trial lenses this is a Snellen chart and uh, depending on what chart you are using in your clinic okay so this is the jackson cross cylinder so this jcc is used uh, to define the astigmatism axis and astigmatism power this is the clock dial method this is also used in astigmatic axis and power refinement this is diochrome test so i will and this is the handheld occluder so i will discuss each and every component separately in next slides okay so here the main question can we do subjective refraction without objective refraction so the answer is yes so here how let's understand and let's find the answer now how objective refraction is done so here you can see in this slide this is the retinoscope and this is the auto refractometer so you can do objective refraction that means you will uh, you can find the refractive status of the patient with the help of retinoscope or auto refractometer so you know this very well that while doing retinoscopy you need to give the patient target the largest optotype at 6 meter distance so that the accommodation will be at rest or minimum but by using auto refractometer you can also get the refractive value but if i give my personal advice then don't be so dependent on auto refractometer and focus on improving your retinoscopy skill that will help you in the long run okay so that's why uh, you should be dependent on retinoscopy not you should not fully depend on auto refractometer okay now what are the steps of this subjective refraction so there is basically three steps of subjective refraction monocular subjective refraction binocular subjective refraction and near vision correction so this binocular subjective refraction is only done in that case where both eye visual equity is same or nearly same here uh, you can see this thing so it is called as pinhole so this will help you a lot during your patient refraction so if the patient visual equity improve after placing this pinhole in the trial frame that will indicate that the patient is having refractive error if the patient visual equity is not improving even after putting this pinhole in the trial frame in front of the patient's eye then it means that the patient might have amblyopia or such kind of conditions and if the visual equity reduce uh, after placing this pinhole it is indicating some kind of macular or renal pathology if the patient is having okay 
So that's all. Let's move to the next slide here. Monocular subjective refraction. So first we will discuss on the monocular subjective refraction. Then we will go to the binocular subjective refraction. Okay. So here starting point of the refraction, then trial and error method, cylindrical excess refinement, cylindrical power selection. Now here, what will be the starting point of the refraction? So remember this thing very well. If you are doing objective refraction, suppose you are doing retinoscopy, then the objective refraction value will be your uh, starting point of the refraction. Whatever value you got in your objective refraction, put that uh, value on the trial uh, frame and start your subjective refraction from that uh, point. So here, having a very good retinoscopy skill will help you to get the accurate or uh, very much precise starting point. Otherwise, you will spend more time in the subjective refraction and it will uh, take long time. So that's why you should have good retinoscopy skill. Now, if you are not having any retinoscope or autorefractor matter in your clinic, but ultimately you need to do what to say patient refraction. So at that stage, you can try this trial and error method. So two things can happen with the patient, whether the patient can have myopia or hypermetropia. Okay. I'm not talking about astigmatism now. So in myopia, it is corrected by minus lenses and uh, 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 hypermetropia, it is corrected by the plus lenses. So alternately put uh, same amount of uh, plus and minus lenses like uh, plus uh, plus one and minus one in front of the patient eye by occluding one eye then uh, say, uh, tell the patient to see the chart and uh, put the mi minus one first and then put the plus one first and ask which lens make the patient see clear if the patient say that after putting this minus one lens my vision is getting clear it is indicating that yes the patient is having minus correction that means the patient is myopic so you can uh, do like uh, lowering the power or getting higher power to get uh, the more visual equity. And also you can put the pinhole and depending on that, you can start your ref uh, subjective refraction if you are not having any retinoscope or autorefractometer. This cylindrical excess refinement, cylindrical power selection. So I will come to this uh, test in the next slides. Okay. So here, fogging technique. So in subjective refraction, this fogging technique is very much useful and also it is very much important as if the patient is having specific complaints like uh, asthenopia symptoms, such things. So this fogging is used by using plus lenses uh, and, and the point of focus will come to foc uh, focus in front of the retina, into the vitreous and that is making the accommodation relax because you are making the patient myopic. So here, if the patient induce accommodation, the patient will shift to more myopia. So the patient uh, have to relax the accommodation, right? So when you put the plus lens, then patient become myopic. So patient have to relax the accommodation. So during this method, a proper control of the accommodation is very important. Uh, otherwise, at the end, refraction value will be not accurate. So who are those patients who need fogging test? First of all, if the patient is having asthenopia symptoms, then fogging is very useful for those patients. Uh, 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 also, uh, those patients who are having overcorrection of minus value, those patients are also need fogging. Then, to the, uh, fogging is also important for those patients who are having latent hypermetropia. Okay. Now, who, uh, who are not good candidate for fogging? So here, uh, first of all, remember this thing: if the patient who are having very poor visual equity, then those patients will not be able to appreciate the pre and post fogging status of the visual equity. So those patients are not that much good candidate for fogging. Now, pediatric patient who needs actually who needs cyclobragic refraction and you are doing fogging refraction where there is not that much good cooperation from the patient you are getting. So fogging uh, technique will not be that much working for those pediatric patients. And patient whose uh, both eye visual equity difference is two line or more than that, then you can't perform fogging to those patients. Okay. Now, what are those equipments that you need to do uh, in doing fogging? So first equipment is you need a trial frame. Then you need one occluder because you will do this fogging monocularly. And then you need trial set, trial lenses. So here, how to do this fogging test? So this 
uh, fogging test is done monocularly with one eye is occluded like this. Then put the objective refraction finding in the trial frame. So this can be your retinoscopy or auto refractometry value. So here I put in the what to say uh, objective refraction. Now selection of the plus lens to fog the patient is very important. You will select that plus lens that make the patient visual equity at least two line worse than the patient visual equity with the objective refraction value. Let's assume the patient objective refraction is plus one. So let's assume this is the plus one lens and this is the objective finding that you got. Now, slowly uh, now uh, put the uh, fogging lens and let's assume that you put what to say this fogging lens is plus 2.5 diopter spherical in front of the patient right eye. Okay, now what you need to do is now slowly reduce the amount of plus lens in 0 0.50 diopter steps and ask the patient to read the chart from upside to down and report when the lines are appear clear. Okay, so in, in this slide, you can see this model and now here as the, I put this plus 2.5 uh, lens uh, here. So now remember, until you place the other lens or next lower less power uh, lens in the trial frame, do not remove this existing uh, fogging lens. Now let's put the uh, less value that is I'm reducing in point minus 0 0.5 that is step. So this is plus 2.5. And now after putting this plus 2.5, I will remove the previous plus. Uh, so after this is the plus 2. So I will remove the plus 2.5. And so I remove the plus 2.5 and now this fogging lens is plus 2. Now I again put uh, plus 1.5 in the trial frame and I will remove uh, this plus 2. Okay. So remember this thing. You will not remove the existing fogging lens until the next fogging lens is uh, put on the trial frame. Okay. Now this is 1.5. Right. Now I will put uh, plus 1 here and I will remove the 1.5 in every step where you are placing the fogging and removing the fogging lens. Ask the patient whether the lines are appearing in a clear manner or not. If the patient says the line are appearing clear and stop removing that lens. Suppose this lens, this plus 1 uh, lens, uh, after putting this lens, the patient can see that, ah, okay, fine, I can read the all letters clearly from upside to down. So this is the final fogging lens you got here. So what is the existing objective refraction value? That is plus one. What is the fogging value you are getting? Plus one. In total, it will be plus two. So here, this I is having plus two amount of power. Okay. So this is how you will do fogging and repeat this test for the other eye. So that's how fogging test is done. Now, let's move to the stenopic slit test for astigmatism axis. So here, uh, astigmatism is one of the most common cause of refractive error and uh, untreated astigmatism can lead to loss of visual acuity and amblyopia. So correction of astigmatism is very important to treat such conditions. Now, stenopic slit test is very quick and handy tool to assess the patient astigmatism status. Normally, to assess the astigmatism, there is lots of procedures, but they are very costly also. Uh, but this simple tool can fix the problem very easily. Even when the patient uh, is having very high amount of astigmatism, where retinoscopy is very hard to perform, then astigmatism come to play the role. So here, what are those equipment that you need to do, uh, you, you should have to do the stenopic split? First of all, you should have trial frame, visual equity chart, occluder, okay, and stenopic split, and the trial step. So here, how to perform this test? So this test is done also monocularly, where you will occlude one eye of the patient with this occluder. Okay. Now, place the stenopic slate in trial frame first at 90 degree and then 180 degree, then 45 and 135 degree axis. So here in this case, we place the stenopic slate at 180 degree meridian. Now two conditions can happen. Either the patient is myopic or hypermetropic. So put the plus lens uh, and one put one plus lens and one minus lens, spherical lens uh, in the uh, trial frame and ask the patient 
whether letter are clear or not and if the patient say with minor minus length letters are clear then increase the minus let, uh, length and there will be one point where the patient will say that the image is clear then rotate uh, the synovic slit to the opposite meridian and again put plus and minus length and ask whether the lines are clear or not so here let's rotate this uh, thing So here, let's sort it. Now, huh. so this is the, so here, previously the stenopic seat was placed at 180 degree meridian and I put both plus and minus lens and with minus lens the patient got the clear visual equity, right? Now here, I rotated at 90 degree apart from uh, 90 degree from that 180 that is uh, 90 degree here and here if the patient again say that the lines are very clear that means the patient is not having any astigmatism but here after rotating it to the opposite meridian if the patient say that now the letters are blurry that means the patient is having cylinder and you need to put again plus and minus lens to see which lens is giving the clear vision Suppose by putting the minus lens, the patient say that yes, now the object is very clear. Then what will be the cylindrical power? So cylindrical power will be the first, uh, what to say, power you got where when the centripetal slit was 180 degree and minus the power you got in the centripetal slit position at 90 degrees. So difference between these two position power it is cylindrical power and what will the what will be the axis axis will be the second power axis that is 90 degrees so 90 degree will be the axis so this is how you can perform synopic split to the patient and you can get the astigmatism axis as well as astigmatism power okay so this is the astigmatism clock dial method so this test also used to see the astigmatism axis and power so as you uh, know very well that there is a difference of curvature of the cornea, then it will lead to formation of two focusing points. So uh, that is called as astigmatism. One thing that I want to add here is in cylinder lens, there is two meridian. One is axis meridian and another is power meridian. And in axis meridian of the cylinder lens, there is no power. And in the other meridian, there is power. So it means that cylinder lens have power in one meridian only, where a spherical lens have power in both the meridians. So as you know about the types of astigmatism, so astigmatism is having five types, right? Simple myopic astigmatism, simple hypermetropic astigmatism, compound myopic astigmatism, compound hypermetropic astigmatism, and lastly the mixed astigmatism, right? So here, this astigmatism dial is consists of 12 radial lines arranged in a circular manner. So here, to uh, do this astigmatic clock dial method, you need this astigmatic clock dial chart and you will make the patient sit at 6 meter distance, you need a trial frame occluder because you will do this test monocularly. So make sure that the patient is sitting 6 meter away from the chart and occlude one eye in the trial frame. Now place the monocular spherical best correction in the trial frame and then add the fogging lens that make the patient vision poorer two lines from the initial visual equity with the best uh, spherical correction. So after you put the fogging lens, patient become artificially myopic. So then, uh, so the reason for fogging uh, the patient is to control the accommodation of the eye during the test. At this stage, one meridian of the patient is close to the retina than the other meridian. Uh, in presence of astigmatism. So after placing the fogging lens in one eye and the other eye is occluded, ask the patient whether all lines are equally clear or blurred. If the patient say that all lines are clear or blurred, it indicates the patient is not having any astigmatism and he is only having spherical refractive error. Now, if the patient say that one line is blackest, then place the cylinder lens 90 degree away from that uh, line and patient said, uh, so here suppose in this case, patient said that this 12-6 line is most clearest one 
and I cannot see this side line, but only this line is very clear. Then this 12 6 line here, you will select this text lower value, multiply it with 30, and you will uh, get the axis of 180 degree. So place the cylinder at 180 degree and then ask the pa uh, patient whether all lines are clear or not. And the patient will definitely say the lines are getting clear. If the patient says that yes, the lines are getting clear, but it is not that much clear, then increase the cylinder power until the patient say that yes, all lines are very clear and that will be the astigmatism axis and astigmatism power. So remember this thing, you will find the astigmatism axis first then you will see the astigmatism power, okay? Because the correct uh, axis can give you the correct power, but an incorrect axis cannot give you the correct power, okay? Now, let's move to the next tense where this is called as Jackson cross cylinder. So, this is called Jackson cross cylinder where Edward Jackson described this method in 1880s. Uh, so sorry for that disturbance happened. Uh, there was point network issues were there. Uh, so that's why the meeting was ended. So I was in Jackson cross cylinder. So let's start this uh, procedure again. So this is Jackson cross cylinder. And here I told you earlier also that Edward Jackson described this method in 1887. So what is Jackson cross cylinder? So this Jackson cross cylinder consists of two cylindrical power of equal strength placed at perpendicular to each other and the handle is placed at about 45 degree uh, to the axis of the Jackson cross cylinder. So here I repeat again that in Jackson cross cylinder test, you will refine the cylindrical axis first, then you will refine the cylindrical power. Okay. So here in Jackson cross cylinder, the, you will get a wide range of power starting from plus minus 0 0.25, then 0 plus minus 0 0.50 then plus minus 0 0.75 and then plus minus 1.00. So selection of the uh, specific Jackson cross cylinder based on the patient visual equity. So in JCC, there is two colors, line, red and green. So red is indicating the minus cylinder and green, green is indicating the plus cylinder. Okay. So here, let's take a case where you did the initial initial uh, refraction and you got the power of minus 1.5 with minus 1.5 cylinder at 180 degree meridian. Now, after putting the initial refraction in the trial frame, then put the JCC handle along the axis of the cylinder and flip the JCC and ask the patient which position is good. So here, in this place here, as I told you earlier, that you will put the uh, JCC handle along the cylindrical axis. So this is the uh, cylindrical power of minus one in the lens trial frame. So here I put the JCC, uh, JCC handle along the cylindrical axis and flip the JCC. This is the position one. And when you will flip it, so here you can see that in position one, uh, green line is above. And in position two here, this is the red line is above, okay? So here, ask the patient which position is clear, position 1 or position 2. Now remember this thing. If the patient is myopic, then uh, you will rotate the uh, cylindrical axis towards the red line. And if the patient is hypermetropic, then you will rotate the axis towards the green line. Now here, as, a, as you see that the patient is having myopic uh, astigmatism. So uh, if the patient says that position 2 is clear, then you will rotate the cylindrical axis towards the upside because red line is upside. And if the patient says the position one is clear, then you can see the red line is downward. So you will rotate the cylindrical axis downside. Okay. So suppose in this case the patient said that position two is clear. That means you will rotate this cylindrical axis a five degree downward. Okay. So this is how uh, astigmatism rota axis rotation is there. Okay. Now, again, after uh, you rotated the cylindrical axis little bit downward, uh, and then again ask the patient that which position is clear by flipping the JCC from position one and position two. And if the patient again say that position uh, two is clear, where the red line is downside. Then again, rotate the cylindrical axis again 5 degree downside towards the red line. And 
and at a point a will come where the patient will say that no there is no difference in uh, po position one and position two that means the cylindrical axis you got the cylindrical axis now now this is the axis refinement where you will get the final cylindrical axis by rotating it in five degree manner now after getting the cylindrical axis you will do power refinement so here how i place the jcc uh, for power refinement so here you will not place the axis now you will align the jcc axis with the cylindrical axis this is, this is the cylindrical axis this is the jcc axis so align the jcc axis along the cylindrical axis and then uh, flip it in this, suppose this is the position one and this is the position two so here in position one position two both you will ask to the patient that which position is clear suppose the patient said that this position one is clear here you see that the red line is along the axis of the cylinder it is indicating that the patient is accepting more minus so you will add my, uh, minus 0 0.25 or minus 0 0.5 depending on what power your jcc is okay and again flip it in position one and position two and ask the patient which position is clear and again if the patient say that yes position uh, one is clear where the red line is over the cylindrical axis then add again more minus and then a, pos a position will come or a point will come where the patient will say no there is no difference in position one and position two that means you got the power final power also so this is how jackson cross cylinder so here this is the prism dissociation test so this test is done after you got the monocular best corrective uh, correction uh, in your subjective refraction okay so here suppose uh, there is a difference of plus minus 1.50 diopter in both eye refractive correction. So at this point, patient may have diplopia or one image may appear more front than the other eye image. So put three diopter base down in uh, one eye and three diopter base up in other eye. So before that, uh, this as you know, it is a binocular balancing technique. So here you don't need an occluder. You just put your monocular subjective refraction value here and after that put the base down prism in the right eye and base up prism in the left eye. The equal amount of prism power. Okay. Then at that time the patient will see right eye image shifted upside and left eye image shifted to the downside. Okay. Then uh, start putting at the same time start putting fogging lens of uh, uh, 0 0.50 diopter uh, steps until the patient uh, inform you that both eye images are equally fogged then the ideal fogging stage you got in the prism dissociation test where the patient is saying that both eye are equally fogged but suppose in a uh, position where the patient say that right eye is quite more clearer than the left eye, then add more plus uh, 0.25 uh, fogging lens in front of the right eye to make those two eye fogging status similar. Okay. Now, that's how prism dissociation test is done. Then, after prism dissociation test, you will move to the alternate occlusion test. So this test is done after prism dissociation, where after the patient uh, informed that both eye are equally blurred, then again put the occluder uh, in front of the one eye and quickly move the occluder to the other eye, then ask uh, again that both eye are equally blurry or not. And if the patient say that both eye are equally blurred, then start uh, defogging the both eye at one time in minus 0 0.50 diopter steps until the patient uh, say that both eye vision is same now. Then move the uh, move to duochrome test. So now alternate occlusion is done now. Now move to the duochrome test. So here, duochrome test is used both for monocular and binocular subjective refraction. So this test is based on chromatic aberration, 
where two light wavelength is used red and green so here red and green as you know very well that red light have wavelength longer so it get focused behind the retina and green light wavelength is shorter so it get focused in front of the retina so this test is uh, based on chromatic aberration uh, where you need a trial lens and if you are doing monocolor correction then occlude one eye but here i am saying uh, i am showing you the binocular balancing so put the uh, subjective refraction value you got after the alternate occlusion method and after that put this occluder uh, in front of one eye and then ask the patient whether both uh, background uh, letters which background letter is more clear if the patient say that red is more clear than the green one then this condition is happening where the red is getting focused on the retina where green is more forward uh, from the retina so at this stage to make both light uh, uh, to make both uh, wavelength focus on the equidistant from the retina what you need to do you need to put in this case minus lens if the patient say that uh, uh, red background letters are more sharp and clear then put the minus lens in front of this eye and ask the patient again now both uh, colors are equally clear or not now at this stage if the patient again say no here red is again uh, clearer than green then again put more my, minus lens in 0 0.50 diopter steps until the patient say that uh, both uh, color are equally balanced now in uh, another case, if the patient say that green uh, letter background is more clear than the red one, then it means that green is getting focused on the retina then, uh, and uh, red is get, uh, getting more backside of the retina. So, at this stage, to make this green focus in front of the retina, you need plus lenses. So, always remember, if the patient say red is more clear, then you will add minus lens. And if the patient say green is more clear, then you will use plus lenses until the patient say both colors are equally clear. And then uh, occlude both eyes and ask the patient alternately that both eyes uh, see these two colors are equally clear or not. And if the patient say yes, both colors are equally clear, then you got the final value in this geochrome method and then your subjective reflection is up. So thank you so much for your kind listening and I hope this video helped you a lot in understanding more about this subjective reflection technique. And I hope you will use these techniques regularly in your OPD to sharpen your clinical skills. Thank you so much. And I will come more uh, with more exciting topic in the next video. Thank you.